Hello and welcome to the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo's March 18th, 2021 Virtual Town Hall on River Breakup 2021. Thank you for joining us. I'm Matthew Harrison. I'll be your moderator for today. I'm also joined by several people this evening, including Mayor Don Scott, Matthew Huff, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, our Director of Emergency Management, Scott Davis, Senior Manager with Environmental Services, Elliot White, James Semple, who is a key lead in our flood recovery operations and a supervisor with Public Works, and Maureen Nakaneshi, a project manager with engineering. The panel here will be available to take your questions on river breakup preparedness and flood mitigation. To get in the queue to ask a question, please press star 3 on your phone, or you can enter your question in your online interface if you're joining us through the web link. Before we open the phone lines and get to your important questions, I would like to invite Mayor Scott to say a few words. Mayor Scott? Thanks very much and good evening everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 8 and unceded Métis territory. The flood of 2020 made us reassess the way that we prepare for river breakup and a lot of work and resources have gone into getting ready for this year. $10 million has been invested for preparedness in addition to the ongoing flood mitigation projects. Approximately two-thirds of that investment is for work on the surface like temporary clay berms and triple dams. The remaining two-thirds is for underground work like plugs, pumps, watertight manhole covers, and other improvements. And that $10 million is not a sunk cost. Much of what we've purchased can be reused in the future, including the clay, from the temporary berms, the triple dams, and any unused sandbag materials. We'll have over 100 staff and contractors on standby, ensuring our preparedness and that we are ready to respond depending on conditions. We'll also have 75 pumps, a total pumping capacity of 5,600 liters per second, 11.5 kilometers of hose, 65 plugs in the underground system, and 40 new watertight manhole covers. While the municipality is actively preparing for river breakup, it is important that residents do as well. Download these three smartphone apps, Alertable, Alberta Emergency Alerts, and Alberta Rivers. Take protective steps to prepare properties close to the river. Free sandbag materials will be available at Sny Park. And most importantly, be aware and stay informed. You can find everything you need to know about River Breakup, including more tips on how to prepare, at rmwb.ca slash riverbreakup. I'll just say that again, rmwb.ca slash riverbreakup. Lastly, as we move closer to River Breakup, some residents could experience a variety of emotions. I encourage residents to watch out for each other, and if you feel that you may need some support, please call the AHS 24-hour mental health helpline. That's 1-877-303-2642. Again, that's 1-877-303-2642. And that number is also available at the rmwb.ca slash river breakup page as well. Please look out for each other. Uh, thank you, Mayor Scott. Uh, for those of you who just heard a loud alarm, it it sounds like we have a, just a regular test uh, alarm here at, uh, at the Jubilee building. So uh, nothing to be alarmed about. It's just a test. Um, we're going to continue uh, with, our, with our town hall. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 3 on your phone to be connected to an operator to get in the queue to ask your important question or enter your question in uh, the online platform, the online interface that, uh, that you may be joining on through our web link. Um, so let's begin with some questions. The, uh, the first one I'd like to begin with um, is a question that I believe uh, is, is most suited for our Director of Emergency Management, Scott uh, Davis. And Mayor Scott mentioned this as well uh, as part of his opening remarks. Um, the question from uh, David uh, says, I have seen stuff about the Alertable app. Is this the same as the emergency alert system? If I sign up, does it push automatically to my phone? So I think the emergency alert system is the, the provincial app that, uh, that he was referring to there. So maybe, um, Scott, if you could just uh, 
talk, tell us a little bit about the Alertable app and uh, and how it works, where people can can uh, can access it. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, David, for your question. Uh, Alertable is a uh, uh, app that's available through the uh, Apple Store and the Android Google Stores for your applicable devices. Uh, when you sign up or download the app, and um, it allows you to pick uh, the RMWB as a whole or with uh, various communities within the RMWB, um, or you can set it to follow yourself. Uh, Alertable allows us as emergency management to send out um, alerts that are giving you notice of life-threatening events, and um, it runs in parallel with the provincial system. Um, the ability for us to send out very timely, concise uh, messaging uh, quicker than the province is, um, is a benefit, and uh, you can set that how you wish. The provincial uh, system is a push, so it will push directly to your phone, uh, regardless of whether you've uh, downloaded uh, the app or not um, for life-threatening events. And uh, the alertable one that we use doesn't have that push capability, so you need to download the app. Um, in addition, there's uh, the Alert Ready uh, through uh, uh, the national uh, framework, and that is um, for large uh, events that uh, uh, Public Safety Canada wants to let uh, people know. So I'm very pleased that Alertable, um, we've uh, procured and set that up. Uh, what I'm especially proud of is that it lets uh, some of our residents that uh, live in the rural communities and um, uh, out in the um, uh, Bush areas, for example, as long as they've got cell signal, they'll be able to get alerts uh, to their phones advising them of life-threatening events. Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Scott. I also want to just note, too, that um, if you visit the uh, River Breakup webpage, so that's rmwb.ca slash riverbreakup, there is an emergency alerts section, and that will provide all the direction on, on um, getting the different apps that, that Scott has, has just talked about. As well on our website, you can subscribe to a, a specific web page. So you could subscribe to the River Breakup page, and then if there's any updates to, to content, um, you'll get a notification. So there's a couple of different ways that you can, uh, you can connect in with us and, and, uh, and get that info. Um, again, please, if you're joining us and you'd like to ask a, a question, press star 3 on your phone to get in the question queue. And, uh, or just type it into the, the online uh, interface. We are going to go to our first live call. Um, Paul, uh, you have a question. I believe that will probably be directing this to James as it's about uh, Ice Jam. So Paul, go ahead, you're live. Okay, uh, yeah, I was uh, wondering about what are they gonna do about the Ice Jams themselves to deal with that. I live in Waterways. We got flooded last year and it cost me thousands of dollars. Uh, to get back, it's just still costing me more. Uh, to and I'm still trying to rebuild from the fire, and and that put me on hold for last season there. So I'm just wondering what they're going to do about the actual ice jams, the root of the problem. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Paul. Very very good question. Um, we did talk about other mitigation measures like the sandbags, the triple dams. What about actual ice jams? What Paul's asking. So James, would you be able to uh, to take that question, please? Or sorry, okay. Our deputy CEO, actually, Matthew Huff, will take that. Thank you for the question. Uh, if you've been uh, uh, following along the uh, uh, the community discussion since last flood uh, period, uh, we have been advancing uh, uh, work to develop a pilot project. Uh, this project would look at. Uh, what we're referring to as active mitigation. So work on the river, uh, whether it be during the winter months uh, or perhaps during the summer, uh, utilizing uh, equipment uh, to improve the uh, 
uh, the, the river itself and lessen the likelihood of ice jam floods. Uh, last year, we addressed numerous questions about more uh, dramatic uh, ways of, uh, of trying to break up ice and, uh, and consulted uh, uh, people across the country uh, who have uh, been dealing with similar things. Uh, we will continue to do this research uh, uh, through to uh, uh, either implementing a, a pilot program uh, or uh, concluding that uh, our more static permanent mitigation uh, is, uh, is what we must depend upon. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much, Matthew. If you want uh, an answer to your important question, um, please press star 3 now on your phone and get in the queue to ask your question. That's star 3 to get in the queue. We'll be with you for, uh, for about the next uh, hour, next 50 minutes anyways, answering your questions. We've got our, uh, our mayor with us, our deputy CAO, as well as representatives from our engineering, public works, and environmental services department, uh, many of which are working on, on the flood recovery, the flood mitigation, and of course, we also have our Director of Emergency Management, um, who is uh, very much involved in the, the river breakup preparations. Again, star three on your phone to, uh, to get into the, the question queue. Um, one of the mitigation efforts that we've uh, talked about thus far uh, is a sandbagging program. So uh, we do have a question from Aaron asking, are sandbags uh, only available until April 1st? So, James, maybe you can perhaps just talk a little bit about the sandbagging program, the intent of it, and, uh, and where people can, can get that. Matthew, uh, that's a good question. Um, we did, when we, when we planned out this uh, sandbag program, the intent was to go till April 1st. Uh, the intent of that is to get, to, to ensure that people have their, uh, their personal property mitigation in place long before we, we'd expect any flooding. Uh, the, the worry of doing it too late into the season would be that they're they're in an area where where it's already dangerous. The ice is already moving. There's already potential for flood. Uh, so so we'd want the the intent was to to have them collect the sandbags, prep their properties long in advance of. Uh, that's why uh, we we we've, we've cut the date off at uh, at April 1st for the sandbag program. Okay. Thanks very much, James. Um, Again, star three on your phone to join in on the conversation and ask your important question. Uh, we're going to be going live now to our second call, and this will be uh, this is related actually to um, Alertable. Um, I'll be directing this to Scott, but first um, let's uh, let's go to Dale, who will be asking this question. Dale, your line is open. Yes, hello there. Uh, yeah, last year you guys put out an emergency alert to the downtown area. But you didn't do nothing for the outlying areas such as Draper Road or anything like that. Are you going to try to put out an emergency alert for every area? Because a friend of mine lost everything. I mean, he was living out there. He lost his trailer, his truck, his car, everything. Okay, thanks very much, very much, Dale. Uh, Scott, can you can you address that? Maybe chat a little bit about how the emergency alert works. Um, and and to Dale's question, is it something that will span beyond just the downtown? Would it be uh, usable for areas of, say, Draper, waterways, et cetera? Yes, uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Dale, for your question. Uh, one of the lessons identified out of the 2020 flood uh, was the ability to get uh, timely, concise alerts out to residents. Uh, that was uh, uh, one of the factors in the procurement and uh, implementation of the alertable lab. Um, it allows you, once you've downloaded, you can set for the entire Wood Buffalo region. So any uh, geographical boundary and anything within that, as long as you have um, cellular signal, you would get an alert. Or if you wanted to pick, pick uh, specific communities such as Draper, you could pick that one only. And uh, what I found last year was the delays in trying to get the alerts out through the provincial system um, just the timing of it uh, by going with Alertable, uh, we're able to be much more nimble, quick, uh, send out that messaging without any delays uh, going through uh, the province. Thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, and I would just add, you know, uh, to, to tune in, of course, to our website, uh, sign up to get alerts when there's updated content, follow us on so social as well. Um, and all the different ways, too, that, uh, that we're pushing information out. So if you have any questions about flood mitigation, about uh, river breakup, please hit star 3 on your phone 
we want to uh, to take your questions this evening, and we've got a, a panel of of, uh, of experts here to to speak about uh, river breakup preparedness. We're going to be going uh, live to uh, to another question, um, and this question is uh, is from from Doug about above ground flooding. Doug, your line is open. Hi, I just want to say thanks for holding the town hall and the questions. I guess so. So my back alley, I live up in Thickwood. In our in our back alley up here is has been you know it was had some construction on it. it used to have a swale through it, and now now it's it don't it doesn't have that anymore. It's all flattened out and and uh, the water's flowing in not just my area but the neighbors too, and they're owned by the bank because they left town or whatever the bank went the, the home went to the bank, and I'm pretty sure they're flooding. And my backyard's flooding, and my window wells to my other neighbors been flooding. And we called Paul Slime last year, but. We haven't haven't seen any changes to the back alley. I don't know if the right people are on a call today to, to take that down or not, but that's my my question. If there's any any plans to fix the back alley up in Thickwood. Okay, thanks thanks Doug. Yeah, so the the, the question is about above ground flooding. Um, Doug was calling specifically from Thickwood, but uh, above ground flooding issues uh, in his neighborhood, and if the city is going to be doing do any work to resolve that. Um, DCO Huff, would you like to take that question? Thank you. Yes, I, I, I would. Uh, this is uh, a challenge uh, for uh, property owners, residents every year uh, as uh, we go through uh, our spring thaw. Uh, so just as, uh, as you did last year, uh, please give, uh, put in that call to Pulse. Uh, we'll make sure that the uh, the operators are, are, are aware that uh, 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 and to expect your call. Um, and to anyone who is experiencing that kind of overland flooding, it may be uh, caused by, uh, by culverts that need to be cleared. Uh, it may be that there has been some regrading in the area that needs to be uh, corrected. Uh, at the very least, uh, our staff will respond uh, and uh, will uh, zero in on the source of the problem and, uh, and help you uh, get it fixed. Uh, thank you, DCO. Um, and, and related to that, actually, uh, I do have another question. But first, again, if you want to ask a question, please press star three on your phone to uh, to get in the queue to ask your your question. Uh, but related to that, and related to to I guess the underground services and and, and pipes and whatnot, um, I have a question for uh, uh, Elliot, who's uh, our representative with Environmental Services. Um, Norm is asking, I would like to hear additional details on steps taken to prevent storm drain backflow. So could you, uh, could you speak a bit to that, Elliot? Thank you, Matthew. Um, we have put uh, different measures in place to uh, prevent storm drain uh, backflows uh, from the river into the community. Um, we put um, two lines of defense, or we are putting two lines of defense at the moment. Um, firstly, we have um, flap gates on all the outfalls. Um, these, out, these flap gates um, have been inspected to ensure that they function correctly. Uh, they will also be inspected again just prior to river break to make sure that there's no uh, debris preventing their operation. Um, the next thing that we have is any manholes that are located between that outfall and the berm, those will be uh, swapped with a watertight manhole cover. So we've already started that program and we're well on their way. Um, what we have done or what we will be doing is we'll be putting monitors in the system uh, just behind those flap gates to monitor any water that potentially could pass that flap gate. And we have a second line of defense where we have plugs in the system. Um, those plugs in the system will prevent any water that passes the flap gates and ensure that we have that second line of defense. Um, behind those plugs, um, it's not a third line of defense, but it's a, um, another defense mechanism, which are, which are pumps. Um, we talked earlier about how many pumps we've brought in, and we have two pumps at each outfall location. Uh, one pump will do the operations, and we have a, the second one as backup. Um, that includes the pump and the, and the hoses as well. Um, so that, those, those mechanisms will be all in place, uh, ready to go April 1 to prevent the, the river from backing up through the storm drain system. 
Okay, thanks very much, Elliot, for the details. Um, I, I understand, uh, Mayor Scott, that you'd like to, to add a couple of other items? Yeah, just to remind everybody, all the residents, that grants are available to install backwater valves in your homes. Uh, th this is additional protection that can be put in place. Grants reimburse the cost of backwater valves and installations up to $1,500. However, if you live inside a flood hazard area, you're eligible uh, for a reimbursement up to $3,000. So homes built after the year 2000 should already have these installed, but older properties sometimes do not. So please consider that as an additional measure that uh, you could take if you live in this region. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, moving along, we're going to go to a, uh, another live question. Uh, this is a question related to uh, ice jamming or ice jam. Um, Joanne, uh, your, your line is open. Hi. Um, I, the question I have is I would like to know if they're going to consider possibly doing the uh, – if it gets to another big jam before it gets to the point of critical like last year, if they would uh, consider using the dynamite like they've used in the past. At least that way it would uh, alleviate the stress on the lower town site area. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I'll direct that to our deputy CEO, Matthew Huff. Matthew, could you speak to that, the use of, of dynamite or, I guess, explosives um, in um, eliminating ice jams? Thank you, and thanks for the question. It was asked numerous times last year, and so uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, to, to address it uh, uh, immediately. Uh, we, we know that hand-placed charges uh, wouldn't work and could be incredibly dangerous. And uh, let me take this opportunity to say that there is no evidence that explosives by way of fighter jet have ever been used in our region. Bombing loosens jams, but doesn't break them up. It makes them worse. They repack and freeze. There was an attempt uh, in 1951 to bomb ice jams uh, in the South Saskatchewan River, uh, just upstream from Medicine Hat, 25 bombs were dropped, and two remain to this day. The bombs did make the situation worse by creating holes that allowed the water into the ice and created a slurry. That slurry refroze and made that, uh, that ice jam flood even worse. We uh, are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, looking at other active mitigation measures uh, that uh, uh, have been adopted by some in uh, different areas of the country. Uh, some methods will work better on, uh, uh, on, on some rivers than other, uh, but uh, we're certainly taking uh, our research uh, very seriously, uh, something that Council will uh, be uh, uh, contemplating uh, before the end of June. So uh, more to come on that, uh, but in the meantime, no, we won't be using explosives. Thank you, Matthew. And I, I believe uh, Mayor Scott has something to add as well. Yeah, I'm just going to add in one quick point. Uh, we had Daniel Winnick here, and he's the former head of Canada's Armed Forces. So he was here during the period of the flood last year. And we spoke about whether fighter jets or explosives would work, and he said absolutely not. And he, uh, he gave a lot of reasons why that were just described by the deputy CAO. But... It is very unlikely, according to his expertise, that it would have any effect. So I just wanted to reassure people that the inquiry was made last year as well, but uh, there was no suggestion it would work. And if it was to ever be tried or employed, and based on what I heard, uh, I don't believe it ever would be, it, the municipality obviously has no control over Canada's fighter jets. And I just want to reassure people that that has been explored. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Scott. Again, this is your opportunity to, to ask the mayor uh, and our administrative team uh, your important questions at star three on your phone to, to get in the queue and to ask your questions. Um, our next question um, is, a, uh, is one that was sent in through our online portal from Dale. Um, I'll be directing this to, uh, to our Director of uh, Emergency Management, uh, Scott Davis. Scott Dale writes, I live downtown beside Keanu College. During both the flood in 2020 and uh, the wildfire in 2016, uh, the area I live in wasn't really given much time to evacuate. 
can something be set up to inform us better with more lead time to evacuate? So Dale is asking about uh, ev evacuation and having more lead time. Scott, could you uh, comment on that, please? Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Dale. Uh, certainly um, throughout my career, any time that uh, I've looked at evacuations, I'm very considerate of the time of day um, and uh, pulling people out in the middle of the night or the morning and trying to balance that with the urgency of the situation. Looking at last year, uh, it was a very dynamic situation and the rise in water um, to, I'd suggest that it's kind of surprised us all. Uh, what we did try to do is use um, the provincial um, Alberta alert to try to get out uh, messaging as quick as possible. And um, uh, hence what we've done is uh, the alertable app, which will allow us to send out uh, timely um, messaging quicker and um, it'll run in parallel with the Alberta alert. So similar to last year, I would do both our uh, RMWB led alertable as well as the provincial system. And then finally, um, what I encourage residents to do uh, pre-event is to monitor rmwb.ca as well as our social media accounts, Facebook and Twitter, for up-to-date information. Um, our information officer can get information out through that uh, very quickly, but again, I encourage you to download the alertable. Um, we've done testing and uh, very pleased with the preliminary test throughout the launch and look forward to uh, using it this year to send out those timely information alerts to yourselves. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, and again, that information uh, about the the alerts, it's on the website, as well as um, a section about um, building or creating a 72-hour emergency preparedness kit um, to pack things that you may you want to have on hand um, so that you can can take with the, with you fairly easily um, in the event of an evacuation. Uh, thank you, Scott, and, and thank you for the question as, as well, Dale. We're going to be going um, live now to another question, but first, again, if you would like to, to ask a question, uh, either enter your question into the online portal or to ask it live, hit star three on your phone. We've got uh, Mayor Scott here, we've got our Deputy CEO, and a number of, of members of administration to speak to uh, to any questions about river breakups. So uh, let's go now to uh, to Larry, who has a question about ice jams. Larry? Yes, I was wondering... Do you monitor the river down, uh, the Athabasca River down towards Fort Mackay, Suncor, Fort Chip? And also, I, w I was present when the, the ice jam happened, um, I believe in the mid-90s. The clear water broke first, and um, the city had hired a guy by the name of Emil Gerard, and I believe I talked about this last year as well. And he came from Fort Chip with a boat, a barge, and a high-pressure water pump. We made them hydraulic hoses out of Suncor where I was working, and that's why I know about it. And he came and cut the ice and got the river flowing. And I was wondering if anything is, is in, in the plan for that in this, uh, in, in this new program that you got going. Uh, okay, that's thanks for math for Matthew, I guess. And yes, <laughs> that's perfect, Matt. Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, so so two questions in there, I see. So the, the first question was just about river monitoring, um, and then the second question about uh, was about using a high pressure spray, I guess it would be to to break up the ice. So. Um, Larry, you, you did anticipate it properly. Uh, we are going to direct that to our Deputy CEO, Matthew Huff. Go ahead, Matthew. Thank you, Larry, for the questions. Uh, the monitoring uh, of rivers is the responsibility of Alberta Environment and Parks. Alberta Environment uh, provides uh, regular updates to our organization, to the RMWB, uh, but they also publish the 
their information, uh, and it is accessible through our website uh, address at rmwb.ca slash riverbreakup. You'll, you'll see a very large um, button right there uh, that you can uh, uh, click on and take a look at all of the river monitoring activities uh, in the area. Closer to uh, River Breakup, our own uh, engineering department works with uh, our emergency management group uh, to do some additional localized uh, monitoring as well. Um, as far as the, the the type of equipment that uh, we are learning about uh, for active mitigation. So ice breaking uh, would be uh, uh, one uh, approach. Uh, the, the, our staff have been uh, uh, receiving uh, calls from vendors and uh, uh, even uh, attending some demonstrations. Uh, there are an, uh, numerous uh, pieces of, uh, of equipment uh, that may be of use to us, uh, active in our region already. And uh, so it's based on, uh, on that information that we're going to be uh, uh, bringing forward uh, a recommendation for a pilot project uh, uh, to Council uh, before the end of June. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, we have a question now from Paul. Paul is going to be asked, is, uh, has a question about uh, fixing, um, fixing the dike further up the road. So, I'll, I'll, Paul, you are live. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm asking about the uh, dikes that uh, go up to go past waterways to protect waterways. They uh, stop at the road. They spent all this money on the, on the dikes, and they they stop at, at the road that goes into the boat launch part. Uh, uh, I, I think it was where the uh, where the uh, uh, gazebo used to be. Anyways, so the water came flowing across the road right at that point. That's what flooded waterways, and uh, and they came up to that point and stopped. And they need to continue it farther for it to have any effect at all. Because if it floods here, it's going to flood downtown too. So uh, we're going to have to uh, deal with the dike there. That was, that was my question. Okay. Th thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. So we're talking about the dike in the area of waterways. So I'm going to direct that to to Maureen uh, Nakaneshi, who's with our engineering department. Could you could you speak to that, uh, Maureen? Thank you for the question. Um, we are continuing our permanent mitigation for waterways, for sure. Um, you can expect to see some construction later this year. So we definitely haven't forgotten about waterways at all. Um, waterways, will, we will continue our permanent mitigation. Um, I'm now going to throw the question over to James Semple to talk a little bit about some of the temporary measures we have for waterways. Thanks, Maureen. Um, yeah, I believe the caller was referring to the, the temporary clay berms that we placed along Sailing Creek Parkway. And, uh, and you are correct that they do stop at the boat launch into Raphael Cree at Park Street. Um, if, if you obviously are in the area, um, across from that intersection, uh, it actually continues again. And we do have um, rapid deployment measures uh, prepared to deploy across that intersection uh, in the event of a flood. So, uh, yes, we do have included in all of our temporary flood mitigation measures, waterways is included and, and, and surrounding it with uh, either temporary clay berms, as you can see now, or rapid deployment measures such as triple dams, as, as you've likely seen around town on, on, on Fontaine Crescent and, and on Clearwater Drive, and, and, and you'll see more in the, in the near future. So hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you uh, both uh, uh, James and, and Maureen for, for responding to that. Um, Question uh, for you, Elliot, uh, with Environmental Services. Rob asks, are homeowners at the flood zones allowed to install manual shutoff valves to prevent sewer backup from the city sewer lines? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, our program allows manual shutoff valves in storm, or sorry, in flood zones. Um, the, the manual valves that are part of our program um, they do have pros and cons, and, and we have to make sure that residents are aware of these pros and cons. Um, obviously, the pro of a manual valve on a sanitary line, um, you, pr you have the ability to prevent stormwater, uh, sorry, flood water from entering your home. Uh, the con is, is keeping that valve closed inadvertently, say, after 
river break season. So what, um, what we have is that the, the, the manual valves are not included in the building code. Um, so we're asking residents to do one extra step. And this extra step is a variance that they will apply to the um, planning and development department. And this step is deliberate to ensure that the residents understand the risks associated with that manual valve. Um, what we ask residents to do is to do their research and talk to their plumber and their expert plumbers that they're, that they're hired to install this manual valve and ensure that it's right for them. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Star three on your phone if you'd like to join in in the conversation and, and ask uh, your important question about uh, river breakup. We've got Mayor Scott here with us, DCO Huff. Uh, we've got representatives from emergency management, environmental services, uh, public works, and engineering. Again, star three on your phone to uh, join in and to ask a question. Turning to an online question, um, Lori uh, has an excellent question uh, for you, James, about some of the, the triple dams. Are the water bladders strong enough to withstand puncture from large ice chunks and floating debris? When we'll be erected 50 feet behind our condo, we will, be, uh, we will face flash flooding if it gives way. So will those water bl bladders be strong enough to withstand any kind of puncturing? Thanks, Matthew, and thank you for your question. Um, these uh, triple dams, have, uh, they, they are designed and manufactured to be puncture and abrasion resistant. Um, these specific triple dams that we've ordered have been upgraded through the manufacturing process to increase the, the abrasion and the puncture resistance. Um, so we're confident in, in, in what they can withstand. Um, in addition to that, they've been placed in locations that uh, are protected from the ice by uh, vegeta adjacent vegetation and slopes and, and topography. So um, in, in the areas that might be more uh, susceptible to ice um, damage, uh, we, most of those areas uh, lie in the, with the temporary clay berms that have been placed. So uh, we're confident in, in, in these, uh, these triple dams and, and what they can withstand. Great. Thanks very much, James. Uh, moving along, uh, I've got a question for our Director of Emergency Management, Scott Davis. Scott, Brenda asks, in the likelihood that families require assistance due to the ice jam uh, or river breakup, I guess, and with COVID being part of the equation, what is in place for safeguards in order for residents to receive timely help? So, Scott, um, this would be, I guess, river breakup response if there's an, uh, an ice jam, and how are we accounting for the, the COVID factor? Uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, uh, Brenda. Um, with COVID, uh, what we've done is worked with Alberta Health Services, Emergency Management, as well as uh, Public Health, and um, they were part of our response last year with our representatives assisting us in uh, the registration site and um, the Regional Emergency Coordination Center. Uh, my emergency social services advisor has uh, reviewed uh, the plan. We've taken the lessons that were identified out of uh, 2020 uh, so as to protect families and ensure a safe um, uh, movement to a reception center and accommodations with uh, COVID um, as a consideration and uh, ensuring the safety of the volunteers and safety of the uh, evacuees. I'm very proud to say that last year uh, the team evacuated 13,800 and there was no corresponding spike in COVID. So uh, all the efforts uh, paid off. Uh, we have an exercise coming up, uh, one day exercise specifically on um, evacuations and uh, the emergency social services group will go through all the protocols of COVID ensuring that uh, uh, they've reviewed everything. And then um, also assure you that uh, throughout COVID, regional emergency services, I'm very proud to say uh, uh, the men and women um, that are members of RES um, have been able to perform rescues and attend to families throughout COVID and uh, take their jobs very seriously in protecting um, residents. And then finally, um, the Vulnerable Persons Registry, which are also known as VPR, and you can find out more information on rmwb.ca. 
Uh, that assists persons who live alone and have uh, uh, disabilities and challenges that uh, could prevent them from uh, evacuating on their own. Uh, we identify where they live uh, through the BPR and uh, we assure that uh, they're safely looked after. Uh, last year we had 13 residents within the uh, evacuation zones and the ESS team and VPR coordinator ensured that all of those uh, VPR registrants were evacuated uh, safely located to uh, um, a hotel and then safely returned back to their homes. So um, in addition is uh, about a week ago, we did a two day exercise with uh, uh, over 150 participants to practice the exercise of an evacuation. And we went through a scenario very much based on uh, last year and uh, that had a, um, all of those participants with uh, keeping COVID in mind. Thanks very much, Scott, and uh, thanks for mentioning that exercise as well. That did come up uh, as one of the questions. Bobby was asking if we've been uh, doing any kind of exercises to uh, to prepare or if we're working with other partner agencies, but yes, uh, as, as Scott just detailed, there there, uh, there was a, a pretty extensive exercise done earlier in, in March with a number of different agencies. Uh, ranging from uh, Alberta Emergency Management uh, to different groups in the area and, of course, with the, with the RMWB. Uh, star 3 on your phone if you'd like to uh, be involved and to ask uh, your important questions about uh, river breakup this year. Uh, we are going to turn to a, uh, a live call now um, about uh, risk factor rating for the flood. Uh, Dermot, you are live. Yeah, hello. Uh, so my question relates to uh the risk factor that could be applied each year uh you know like if you take into consideration the amount of new snowpack that is on the rockies whatever where our water floods usually come from when they get the rain down there it, it comes to hit that's what happened last year primarily so i would like to see a risk factor for flooding based on that snowpack and what uh, four or five days of rain could do, something that would give us a general idea. So in February or something, you might be already assigning a 10% risk because there's a high snowpack. But I'd like to see something where we could look and, and you could report to us, instead of everybody having to go and look at size up and make their own determination, why not present us with a risk factor scale of zero to 100 that way? and and not only that, but a sign, say, when we hit 30% on that risk factor, we're going to implement our uh, disaster uh, initiatives, you know, uh, something like that. So is yeah. that being considered? Are you monitoring to that scale? I, I, I hear what you're asking, Dermot. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Absolutely. That, you know, we can we can look ahead and see based on, say, the, the snowfall amount and the snowpack that can we... Uh, can we predict kind of the percentage of, of, of how severe a, a jam may be or how river breakup will play out? So I'm going to turn to this. Might, there might be a few people involved in the response to this, uh, Dermot, but we'll, we'll start with Maureen, who's with engineering. Uh, Maureen, could you, could you just comment on this? Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the question. Um, snowpack and snow melt is only one of many factors that influence ice jam flooding. Um, ice th thickness seems to be a really significant one as well. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had much luck with long-range forecasting of ice jams because their formation is so dependent on the conditions at that particular moment in time rather than uh, conditions that have been set up in advance. So it's, it's really challenging to get any sort of long-range forecast for um, ice jams, but we do continue to um, monitor monitor the river movement, but to date, ice thickness has been the most significant factor we've seen so far. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, for that insight, Maureen. Okay, we are going to go to a, another live call. Uh, this one I'll direct to Elliot. It's actually, uh, it's about uh, a backwater valve installation. So, uh, Chris, uh, your line is open. I, I, I was uh, wondering, I heard uh, Dr. Uh, Doc, sorry about that. Uh, Mayor Scott uh, say something about uh, backflow valves uh, having been installed in homes built after 2000. I was wondering if there is any uh, 
difference between a backflow valve and a sewer backup uh, valve. And uh, where I would be able to confirm whether a house uh, built around 2009 does have uh, that feature uh, incorporated in the structure or not. Great, thanks very much, Chris. So, uh, so Elliot, a bit more of a technical question, uh, just about uh, well, uh, Chris's home and being built uh, at 2009, just, uh, whether or not there'd be a backup valve. So, perhaps you could uh, could address that. Thank you, Matthew. Um, there's there's multiple names that are common that people use: backwater valves, uh, backwater prevention. Um, so it's it's they're all similar. Valves. It's, it's essentially a check valve um, that's put on that system. Um, the reason the 2000 is key is that we know for a fact that anything post 2000, um, the, the building code required a backwater valve in your system. So it's just a matter of um, maybe checking yourself or, or hiring someone to come into your home and having a check. Um, the other thing that I recommend to people that have backwater valves. Um, whether they're installed either pre or, or post 2000 is to to get that checked every so often with a, with a licensed plumber to make sure that it's functioning correctly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elliot. Um, we're going to turn to another live question. Um, this one relates to uh, to downtown revitalization, and it's a question from. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. From Ilda. Ilda, your, your mic's open. Thank you. My question has to do with the city continues to encourage involvement in the, uh, the business revitalization zones downtown. So there is money being allocated. There is money being spent through plans or whatever else. But we have no protection solidly from the river. So why? Would the residents or businesses wish to continue to put more money into downtown and occupy downtown if we cannot be assured that we have a permanent solution to the river breakup, including insurances? Okay, certainly uh, a, a very uh, valid question from Ilda. I'm going to actually uh, turn to Mayor Scott for that one. So her question is really, um, why are we investing in downtown revitalization um, if we can't protect the downtown? Mayor Scott? You know, I've, I've heard those same concerns a lot in the last year. And just to remind everybody who's on the line, uh, the flood that we had last year was not the first in the region. In fact, we've had 17 floods since 1835 so there have been a lot of floods in this region but this is the council that's actually taken a significant step to provide a permanent mitigation solution we're spending 257 million dollars to protect the downtown and other parts of the region so we're going to be in a far better shape after I finish, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew, who can speak to the timeline as to when that's going to be complete. So in my view, it's it's not one or the other. It's not downtown or nothing. It's or flood mitigation. We need to protect the downtown and other parts of the region, but we also need to invest in the downtown. I believe in our downtown. I believe in the businesses in the downtown. And I certainly want to encourage people to support those businesses. You know, they've been through a lot and they've struggled a lot, but uh, we are taking steps to protect this, uh, this region. And $257 million is a huge step. And quite frankly, it should have been done a very long time ago. You know, since 1835, this has been going on. It's, been, it's long overdue. But this is the council that's dealing with it. So we do believe in the downtown, and we also believe in flood mitigation and we are building projects with flood protection in mind. So I'm just going to go over to Matthew, our deputy CAO. He's going to be able to give everybody a sense of a timeline as to when the flood mitigation projects are going to be completed. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Uh, and uh, and just to uh, uh, to note that uh, uh, over the last year, um, the RMWB 
uh, and also uh, uh, Wood Buffalo Economic Development and Tourism have been working uh, with downtown businesses uh, to not only return them uh, to their spaces and uh, and, o and operation, uh, but also enhance uh, the downtown as part of our downtown revitalization program. We're doing both. We're, uh, we're investing in the downtown and we're advancing the flood mitigation program. Again, take a look online, rmwb.ca slash river breakup. You'll see uh, another large button there uh, that will take you to our flood mitigation program. Uh, that's the permanent construction uh, of berms that will protect various areas throughout the lower town site. And, uh, and just to uh, circle right back to where we began this evening, to get us through 2021, there are an extensive uh, um, amount of temporary measures being put in place to ensure that if there was a repeat event, that we would be ready, that uh, our berms would be shored up, whether uh, it be with temporary clay or triple dams, and our subsurface infrastructure, so the underground pipes are going to be uh, managed in such a way to ensure that uh, they are not a conduit for water from the rivers. So I hope that uh, uh, that speaks to, you, uh, to your question. Uh, we uh, are uh, in a good position for both downtown rev revitalization and flood mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, D.C. O'Huff and, and, and Mayor Scott for uh, responding to that question. Um, looking a little bit uh, north of the downtown core, we have a question uh, from Tracy. I'll, I'll direct this to James, who's uh, an important member of our flood recovery team and part of Public Works. Um, Tracy asks, what are the mitigation plans for the Tiago Nova uh, Eco Industrial Park? James? Thanks, Matthew. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, when Taganova was developed, there there actually was um, flood mitigation uh, implemented around the areas. Um, of course, it it was not complete. Um, we've we've reviewed the areas and and completed uh, any berms that surround Taganova uh, with with uh, temporary clay as well. And then uh, there will be. Uh, a, a broader plan for permanent mitigation around uh, around Taganova as well, and uh, so with a combination of, of temporary clay and, and triple dams for one smaller section, uh, Taganova will be protected for the one in year one in one in one hundred year flood uh, for this year. Great, thanks very much, James. Um, sticking with another online question from uh, from Bobby, and I'll direct this to uh, Elliot White with the, our environmental services team. Uh, Bobby asks, what has been done to protect the water treatment plant? Elliot? Thank you, Matthew. Um, at the water treatment plant, we isolated um, all the systems that are connected to the river in a high river event to make sure that we prevent a um, similar event from last year. We've also inspected and repaired key valves and key infrastructure at the water treatment plant. And another uh, important factor uh, that we've done is we, we looked at all of the uh, SCADA systems, which are the communication and com computer systems at the water treatment plant, and we've, we've upgraded those systems as well to provide another level of, of alarms um, at the water treatment plant and during high river events. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Elliot. Uh, I'm going to turn to Scott now. Uh, with uh, We've got another online question. This is about ev evacuation. Um, the question is, does the RM have a plan in place for evacuation of the downtown core, et cetera, for residents who do not have access to a vehicle? So evacuating uh, residents who may not have access to a vehicle. Uh, Scott Davis, our Director of Emergency Management, if you could, uh, if you could take that question, please. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And, uh uh, the easiest way to answer this question is, uh, yes, we do. What I would encourage uh, all residents, um, back in 2019, uh, we had a campaign where we delivered the community emergency guides to homes uh, throughout the RMWB, including uh, Lower Townsite and, and Waterways and Draper. 
Uh, in those community emergency guides are instructions related to uh, evacuation and muster points. And what we would do as the Regional Emergency Coordination Center work with our transit as well as contracted bus services to evacuate residents that didn't have uh, uh, transportation and of course at no charge. Uh, the muster points are identified on the uh, community emergency guides. They can also be found at rmwb.ca and uh, we would uh, through the alertable system uh, let uh, residents know where those uh, muster points are and uh, uh, the buses would be awaiting to take them to the registration center. Uh, we used uh, very similar last year in 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Scott, for that. Um, question for our uh, our DCO from uh, Lori. Um, she asks, why do we not dredge the shallow river sections? So a dredging question. Uh, DCO Huff. Uh, thank you again for uh, for the question. Uh, that is uh, something that uh, may uh, be uh, effective, but uh, we are uh, uh, researching and uh, and learning about those uh, those options before engaging uh, the provincial and federal regulators. Uh, whereas uh, uh, our uh, um, uh, the RMWB, uh, of course, uh, uh, has a jurisdiction on land. When it comes to the to the waterways, Alberta Environment and Parks and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans are are both regulators that we must uh, work with and uh, and be approved by before we do anything to uh, the rivers themselves. Uh, dredging is used in, uh, in other places uh, to uh, lessen the severity of ice buildup uh, on waterways. Whether that would work uh, uh, for our rivers or not uh, is yet to be proven. However, we're certainly taking a very close look at it. Okay, thanks very much, Matthew. Now, we are in the, uh, the closing minutes of our, of our town hall. We have time for one more question. Um, and it's, it's a question, again, about the, the back valves program. Um, and so we're going to be going to Cal, who is live. Cal, your, your line is open. Good evening, everyone. I'll make it really quick. We're short on time. Uh, thank you, all of you, for participating. We appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, this is for you. Um, as you know, us who live in the downtown area have taken quite a hit uh, financially on the value of our homes. The last flood and the back valve uh, program that you spoke of. Uh, sir, I'd really like a, a better explanation uh, from you as to why we have to flip the bill for this and then go for a refund. Um, if you wouldn't mind, sir, no disrespect, but please a better explanation. Sure, yeah, that's the program that was set up by council at, a, at an open council meeting. So this region's never had a, a program like this ever in history. And what we did is we modeled it in a comparable way to other places, other uh, places in Alberta. Alberta uh, has several examples, one being Edmonton, I believe. We have uh, probably one of the more generous approaches to uh, this program, as I recall. And I'm just looking to see if Matthew, the DCAO, wants to, and just to remind you, if you do get a backwater valve, you can be, if you're in a flood hazard area, you can be reimbursed for up to $3,000. So just over to Matthew, you might be able to speak to some of the details a bit more. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Yes, uh, three thousand dollars for uh, uh, would uh, be reimbursed uh, towards uh, this work uh, for uh, property owners uh, installing a backflow uh, uh, valve uh, in the flood-prone area, uh, and fifteen hundred dollars to uh, to those uh, who aren't. Uh, this uh, program was model modeled on both Edmonton and Moncton, uh, New Brunswick, and uh, we believe it is the, uh, uh, the best approach uh, to do so uh, and similar to other grant programs our organization runs. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Mayor Scott, uh, and thanks for the question as well, Cal. And, and really, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us for this town hall, who uh, took time out of their day and, and uh, submitted questions either on the phone or online. 
Uh, we've, we've run out of time for the evening, uh, but in the remaining couple of minutes, uh, I just want to turn the floor over to, uh, to Mayor Scott to provide some, some uh, concluding remarks. Mayor Scott? Thanks very much, Matthew. I just want to thank everybody for participating, and I can tell you just uh, having dealt with the administrative team here at the municipality, they are very passionate about making sure that this region is safe for this coming flood season, and uh, I'm, I'm just very grateful that we have the team that's working very hard at that. And there's a lot to be done for permanent mitigation, but we have a team that's very committed to that, and you also have a council that's very committed. They send emails on this topic every day asking questions, making sure that every base is covered as much as they are able. So, you know, I, I really believe that a lot has been done and will be done going forward. And as, as, as I said previously, this is the council that's trying to make sure that the issue that happened last year should never happen again to this community. And I think the measures that we are taking are going to be a strong step in that direction. So I do want to thank everyone and the entire community. Please do stay safe, everybody, and take care. And thank you very much, uh, Mayor Scott, for, for that. Now, we recognize that due to time restraints, so we may not have been able to get to, uh, to your questions. So feel free to send that along to townhall at rmwb.ca, or if you think of something down the line in the, the days and the weeks ahead, reach out to Pulse and, and ask. Uh, for those of you who have joined us on the phone, at the end of this call, at the end of this town hall, you'll have the opportunity to leave a voice message and share your thoughts on this topic, and that's, that's coming up in a, in a matter of moments. I'd like to thank all our panelists, uh, Mayor Scott, uh, DCO Matthew Huff, uh, Scott Davis, Elliot White, James Semple, uh, Maureen Akineshi, for being with us this evening. Um, and, and thank you, Vieri, uh, from Converso, for the technical support and all the support from our communications and engagement and IT team with the, the administrative uh, work. Of course, thanks to all of you for being part of this conversation, uh, for taking time out of your evening uh, to, to learn more about River Breakup and to ask your important questions. And, and please be sure to visit us at rmwb.ca slash riverbreakup for all the information you need for River Breakup 2021. Thanks very much, and have a good evening.